All right, guys, look at what came in the mail today. This is the Northwest Digital Radio Draws Hat, or Digital Radio Amateur Workstation Draws. As in, show us your draws. And what this guy here does is it provides power to the Raspberry Pi. There's a 12 volt power connector right here. Goes through a buck converter circuit and then through the GPIO header actually provides the proper amount of power for the Pi using the same power that your radio takes. Fantastic. It's an accessory port here with a couple of I.O. pins and some power and ground and uh, analog inputs. This guy here is pretty cool. This is an antenna connector for a GPS antenna, which will turn this thing into a uh, time source and will also provide a time signal for all of your digital applications and a battery backed clock for your Raspberry Pi so that you can continue to keep your time even when you don't have a good solid GPS signal. These two connectors here are for two radios, not two specific radios, but just two radios. Um, so you can power an HF radio on one side and a UHF VHF radio on the other side so you have access to the entire band. Let's see if there's any other cool things this guy can do. Nope, that's about it for the hardware side of things. Obviously you plug this thing into a Raspberry Pi which gives you all the wonderful things that Raspberry Pis give you. Uh, so, uh, USB power in, which you no longer need because you're powering from the draws board. HDMI port so you can see what's going on. Uh, Ethernet for USB so you can plug in your keyboard and your mouse. And uh, this whole thing can be accessed via Wi-Fi. So this could be your shack in a box and you could remote control this thing from anywhere you have internet access. Or you could plug your devices in and then uh, set up a local area network or a local Wi-Fi access point set up and use VNC or something like that to remote control the Pi and then do all of your radio work from a comfortable laptop or a iPhone or Android or uh, some other kind of tablet or computing device. So, pretty cool stuff. Let's get started with the software. All right, welcome back to part two. We are going to download the image from the Linux command line. This is an Ubuntu machine, and it's running 18.04, but that really doesn't matter because all we're doing it, all we're doing with it is uh, the utility work of downloading the files. So, first thing to do is to go out to the Digital Radio Groups I/O page and look at the directions in the wiki, which give you a command line to use to download. That command line is wget, and uh, there's the URL for you. So she's downloading, and we will come back when it is done. ETA is 45 minutes, so it'll be a while. But it'll be just a flash for you guys. All right, that is out of the way. Let's take a look, verify that we got the download we were expecting. Two and a half gigs, current beta zip, sounds about right. Let's do some of that unzip magic. All right, we'll speed this one up and be right back. All right, that didn't take as long as I thought it would. Next thing to do is install the Department of Defense Computer Forensics Lab version of DD. This shouldn't take too long. And we're done. The next part is where we need to find out what device we are writing to. And on Linux, there's a pretty quick, easy way to do that with lsblk for list block devices. Block device is a fancy word for disk. And couldn't do figure out where it is. All right, so this SDA is 230 gigs. That's clearly not it. That would be my primary hard disk in this machine, which I booted off of. This 
SDC looks very promising though because it's a 32 gig SD card and that looks pretty darn close to 32 gigs. So we're going to use dev SDC on this command. Time, because we don't know how long it took. DCFLDD IF equals. And before we do that, let's look at the files because it's not, as it says in the directions, current beta.img, it draws beta10.img, which is fine. equals slash dev slash sdc block size equals four megs status equals progress and when we're done flush the buffers out to the disk sometimes your operating system will cache the writes and sometimes it won't and this will take care of that it'll actually make sure that everything gets written out to the disk and it didn't like that file because even though I checked what the file name was, I typed in the old file anyway because I was reading the directions. So let's fix that. Hey, look at that. This is about a six gig image, so this will take a little while and we will speed it up for you so you don't have to sit there and stare at it like I do. That is all finished. Looks like it took about six and a half minutes. Not too bad for writing six and a half gigs out to disk. Uh, one last sync because that's how we are. And I'll show you how to do it in Etcher and then we will get the Pi booted up. All right, ham fans and command line challenge types. This is Etcher. The current version is called Belina Etcher, Belina, Belina, I don't know how to pronounce that. And uh, pretty straightforward. The first thing you want to do is select your image. I've already extracted the image from the zip file on this machine, so you don't have to watch that happen again. Um, most modern GUI operating systems, it's as simple as right click and select extract. So not exactly rocket science there. Etcher will typically choose the SD card or USB flash drive that makes sense and it will only allow you to use uh, removable media and in this case it got it spot on so no problem there when we click the flash button away it goes and it says it's going to take about six and a half minutes so we'll be back after the break all right, a few seconds left here, and then it should go into the verify step. And that's basically going to read back the disk and compare it and make sure that everything is good. Looks like that's going to take about three minutes, and we'll be done. That is it for this video. Stay tuned for the next video where we boot up the Pi and walk through the initial configuration. 73 and have fun.